Welcome back, everyone. My name is Julie Nasevic, and this is the second lecture in week three of Neuroscience and Relationships, Understanding Human Development and Well-Being. In your reading assignments and coloring book assignments, you've now covered the basics of learning about the social brain concept. You've read about how the brain has evolved and what the basic structures of the brain are and the roles played by certain regions of the brain. You've also learned about neurons and neuroglia and how the action potential results in a nerve impulse and how the nerve impulse travels up the length of the neuron. Hopefully you don't feel too overwhelmed by all the technicalities. You may not remember the details of how, how all of this functions, but having understood these mechanisms will help you later to better comprehend how medications work and how pathology can sometimes occur from a biological perspective. Here's an example of something you may not have understood before your knowledge of action potentials, but now you can impress your friends and family with. You may have heard of arrhythmia, otherwise known as irregular heartbeat. Arrhythmias are actually a result of anomalies in the cardiac action potential. In other words, the nerve cells responsible for making our heartbeat are not firing as usual. This can be caused by a congenital mutation or an injury. Understanding details like this helps us to identify drugs that can intervene with this specific malfunction. Arrhythmia is treated by drugs that directly act on the cardiac action potential. In psychology, disorders such as anxiety and depression can be greatly affected by the amount of neurotransmitters being released into the synapse as a result of action potentials. While a direct relationship between neurotransmitters and mental illness is by no means definitively established, by experimenting with drugs and observing how certain drugs result in relief of specific symptoms, while others aggravate certain symptoms, we have come to make conclusions about which neurotransmitters are involved in mental health disorders. The focus of this lecture is to explore the most common neurotransmitters and hormones and what we know to be some of their roles as pertaining to neuropsychology. Objectives for the second lecture are, first I'll give a brief historical perspective about the discovery of neurotransmitters, nowhere near extensive as the first lecture, so don't worry. Then I'm going to talk about the difference between hormones and neurotransmitters. And then I'll introduce you to the major neurotransmitters that you should be familiar with. You've probably heard of most of these. We won't go too crazy with the obscure ones. I think this is important because it's not really covered thoroughly in the assigned reading, but the neurotransmitters will be mentioned often. So this will give you a little background info, and you can feel more confident when you see them mentioned. It's part of the fundamental nuts and bolts of neuropsychology. Also, knowledge about neurotransmitters will greatly help your understanding of psychopharmacology, both when working with psychotropic medication, as well as understanding the mechanisms of recreational or commonly abused substances. And then lastly, I'll review the hormones that are secreted by the endocrine glands located in the brain. I'm going to do this very briefly and simplistically because it could be an entire class in itself. So let's get started. By the end of the 19th century, brain scientists were still unclear as to how neurons communicated with one another, and for example, how a neuron could make a muscle contract. The prevailing theory was that the nerve impulses traveled in between neurons with electricity. Similar to how the electrical impulse surges through the single neuron, it was proposed the electrical wave traveled from one neuron to neuron, possibly by way of sparks to cross the gaps. One of the problems with this theory was that if it is electrical, why was it happening in only one direction? In 1877, before the term synapse was even coined by Charles Sherrington, the German physiologist named Emile dubois raymond hypothesized that nerves excite muscles either electrically, the prevailing theory of the time, or chemically, a somewhat radical concept. His theory went mostly unnoticed, and when, three decades later, the idea that chemicals were involved in neural transmission reappeared, the British researchers responsible for reemergence of the idea were unaware of dubois raymonds work, or at least did not give him any credit. As a side note, when I come across these little known people, I like to bring them to light because, as you know, what generally ends up in the history books is not always the whole truth. So dubois raymonds hypothesis reportedly got buried in a German text somewhere and was not taken seriously because there was no evidence to support his idea. 
At that time in history, many of the scientists responsible for resurfacing of the theory were busy studying the autonomic nervous system. That's the part of our nervous system responsible for regulating internal functions such as breathing, heart rate, etc. In these good old days, obviously before ethics boards, an English physician, George Oliver, who I couldn't find a picture of, was reportedly experimenting on himself and his family members. During one experiment, whereby he was attempting to measure the diameter of an artery under the skin using an instrument he had invented, Oliver reportedly administered extracts from an animal's adrenal gland to his son and observed the effect of his son's artery narrowing dramatically and his blood pressure rising. One wonders what happened to that poor kid and if he survived his childhood. Anyway, Oliver was so excited he took his discovery to a colleague, Edward Schaefer, in London. Schaefer and Oliver studied the actions of adrenal extract on dogs and frogs, publishing their observations in the Journal of Physiology in 1894 and 95. Sir Edward Schaefer, an English physiologist, is now regarded as the founder of endocrinology. He was the one who actually coined the terms endocrine and the word insulin. Endocrinology is the study of our endocrine system, the set of bodily glands that are responsible for secreting hormones. So then more studies followed Oliver and Schaefer's work, most notably in Russia and in Cambridge. And in 1904, Thomas Renton Elliott, a student at Cambridge, addressing the Physiological Society of London, proposed that nerves of the sympathetic nervous system may be producing their effects by releasing adrenaline or an adrenaline-like substance, suggesting that release of a chemical at the end of a nerve cell may be responsible for chemical transmission of messages between neurons. Soon thereafter, Walter Dixon, a pharmacologist at Cambridge, was experimenting with frog hearts when he discovered a substance that had an inhibitory effect on the heart that slowed the heart down. He concluded that this transmitter substance was stored in certain nerve endings until set free by neural activation. Interestingly, Elliot and Dixon's publications were not well received. In fact, reportedly Dixon was discouraged by the widespread skepticism and deterred from further experimentation. However, one particular figure was very much impressed by these studies and would eventually go on to identify the transmitter substance that Dixon had discovered. You may remember from our first lecture, Henry Dale. Well, Dale was in London studying the physiological properties of ergo, a fungus that grows on rye. And during this research, and in the following years of ongoing work, Dale essentially discovered what we now call noradrenaline, aka norepinephrine. He was also researching a substance named acetylcholine, which at that time was actually a synthetic drug. Dale suspected it would eventually be found in the body in natural form, but it would be years before strong evidence supported his theories, one reason being the interruption of the First World War. You may also recall from our first lecture, Otto Lerby, a German physician. Well, Lerby famously claims to have realized the way to test the theory of chemical transmission in a dream. His experiments in 1921 provided the proof necessary to convince the scientific community that neurotransmission was a chemical affair. With the help of then-friend Henry Dale, the two concluded that the chemical transmitter Larrabee and Dixon before him was observing in his experiments was, in fact, a natural form of acetylcholine. From there, experiments began to study the theory that certain diseases and conditions were a result of too much or too little of certain chemical substances in the nervous system. And then in 1936 was when Dale and Larrabee shared their Nobel Prize for their discoveries relating to chemical transmission of nerve impulses. The Nobel Prize, unbeknownst to me before Google Images opened my eyes, looks like this, a gold coin. Incidentally, in 1938, Larrabee, who was Jewish, was arrested and imprisoned by the Nazis for two months. Fortunately, he and his two sons were released from jail and permitted to leave the country only after agreeing to give all of his Nobel Prize money and material possessions to the Nazis. He eventually immigrated to America, where he ended up working at New York University. Okay, now let's move on to neurotransmitters and hormones. First of all, what's the difference? We know both are some form of chemical inside our bodies that play major roles in bodily functions. So hormones are chemicals released into the bloodstream 
by a cell or a gland, mostly endocrine gland, a hormone travels in the bloodstream until it encounters target cells that are sensitive to their particular shape and structure and that have specialized receptors for the purpose of receiving the hormone. An example is insulin, which is produced by the pancreas and distributed to target cells throughout the body, but especially in the liver, the skeletal muscles, and adipose tissues for the purpose of decreasing blood glucose levels in our body by either putting it to good use or storing it as fat. Now, neurotransmitters, on the other hand, are chemicals moving via impulses in neurons in our central nervous system. We have over 100 neurotransmitters in our brain secreted by vesicles in the synaptic bulb of one neuron directly opposite a synapse to its target cell. Travel by neurotransmitter is generally much faster than through the endocrine system. Now, just to confuse you further, some hormones act like neurotransmitters in certain circumstances. For example, adrenaline, which is a hormone when it is released by the adrenal gland and travels through the bloodstream to the heart or lungs, can also act as a neurotransmitter when it is released from a presynaptic cell to receptors on a postsynaptic cell. So simply stated, while neurotransmitters and hormones are both chemicals that affect regulation of bodily function, the distinguishing factor is where the molecule is released, into the bloodstream or into the synapse and whether it is commissioned by the endocrine system or via the nervous system. As you saw in plate 2.5 of the coloring book, synaptic transmission is the process of neurotransmitters moving across synapses to affect change in the nervous system. Briefly, the process looks like this. When an impulse reaches the presynaptic terminal, it is accompanied by calcium ions, which bind to carrier molecules and result in the synaptic vesicles, containing the neuro neurotransmitters, migrating to the presynaptic membrane, fusing with the presynaptic membrane, and then releasing transmitters into the synapse. This slide shows seven processes of neurotransmitter action. So I'll read through them. Number one, neurotransmitter molecules are synthesized from precursors under the influence of enzymes. Number two, neurotransmitter molecules are stored in vesicles. Number three, neurotransmitter molecules that leak from the vesicles are destroyed by enzymes. Number four, action potentials cause vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release their neurotransmitter molecules into the synapse. Number five, released neurotransmitter molecules may bind with autoreceptors and inhibit subsequent neurotransmitter release. Number six, Released neurotransmitter molecules bind to postsynaptic receptors. And number seven, released neurotransmitter molecules are deactivated either by reuptake or enzymatic degradation. So in other words, once a neurotransmitter has been released into the synapse, there are several possible effects. First, there is the possibility that the neurotransmitter molecules will successfully bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Second, and this is not an either-or, but a both-and situation, enzymes in the synaptic cleft break down any neurotransmitter remaining in the synapse. This is essentially the cleanup. And or, the presynaptic cell actually takes back in the remaining neurotransmitter. This is called reuptake. This may sound familiar to you if you recognize that SSRI medications, such as Prozac, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They inhibit the reuptake, therefore leaving more serotonin in the synapse for potential of successfully transmitting to more receptors. And in some cases, such as glutamate, the neurotransmitter left in the synaptic cleft after release is taken into an adjacent glial cell reprocess, and return to the presynaptic nerve terminal. There are different ways to classify neurotransmitters. One way is by breaking them into families based on their molecular makeup. Incidentally, this picture on your screen is serotonin, which you don't need in the lab. The amine family includes our friend acetylcholine and the ever-popular catecholamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine as well as the indolamine, serotonin. And please don't assume that I'm pronouncing any of these correctly. 
The amino acids include gamma amino butyric acid, also known as GABA, glutamate, and glycine. The neuropeptides include the enkephalin, endorphin, and dynafin. The peptides include oxytocin, substance P, cholecystokinin, vasopressin, and hypothalamic releasing hormones. Lastly, there are gases that act as neurotransmitters, including nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. Another way to describe neurotransmitters is as excitatory or inhibitory. In the pictures, I'm trying to illustrate excitation by the concept of pulling, the neurotransmitter being the excited dog in this picture, while inhibition is more like dragging, the neurotransmitter in this image being the ball in chain. But this can be confusing because many neurotransmitters can have both excitatory and inhibitory effects. It's actually the specialized receptors which determine whether the neurotransmitter will have an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. You can look at it this way. A, neuro a neurotransmitter's job is to activate one or more type of receptors. The effect on the postsynaptic cell depends, therefore, entirely on the properties of the receptors receiving the message. For some neurotransmitters, the most important receptors all have excitatory effects. That is, they increase the probability that the target cell will fire an action potential. During excitatory transmission, the neurotransmitter to receptor reaction on the postsynaptic membrane depolarizes the membrane and initiates an action potential. Acetylcholine is typically an excitatory neurotransmitter. For other neurotransmitters, the most important receptors all have inhibitory effects. During inhibitory transmission, the reaction between a neurotransmitter and the receptor hyperpolarizes the membrane and actually makes it more difficult for the postsynaptic neuron to have an action potential. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Many sedatives and tranquilizing drugs act by enhancing the effects of GABA. However, some neurotransmitters, acetylcholine being one example, have both excitatory and inhibitory receptors waiting for them. And there are still other types of receptors that activate complex metabolic pathways in the postsynaptic cell to produce effects that cannot appropriately be called either excitatory or inhibitory. Thus, it is an oversimplification to call neurotransmitter excitatory or inhibitory. Nevertheless, you will often see neurotransmitters described in this way. Now we will look at some of the specific neurotransmitters and what their roles are. Acetylcholine, which we have heard so much about, was originally found to be associated with slower heart rate in frogs. It was actually manufactured as a synthetic drug starting in 1867 and only later discovered to be also found organically in the human body thanks to Dixon, Dale, and Larrabee. Acetylcholine is one of those neurotransmitters that is both inhibitory and excitatory. In cardiac tissue, as observed by Dixon, Acetylcholine neurotransmission has an inhibitory effect, lowering heart rate. However, it also behaves as an excitatory neurotransmitter at neuromuscular junctions in skeletal muscle. In the peripheral nervous system, that's the subdivision of the nervous system that includes all the nerves and ganglia outside of the brain and spinal cord, acetylcholine activates our muscles. Found at the junction where motor nerves and muscles connect, Acetylcholine binds to receptors on skeletal muscle fibers, opening sodium channels in the cell membrane. Sodium ions then enter the muscle cell, initiating a sequence of steps that finally produce muscle contraction. In this regard, it is acting as an excitatory neurotransmitter. The paralytic arrow, poison, curare, acts by blocking transmission at these synapses. Curare is used as a paralyzing poison by South American indigenous people, whereby prey is shot by arrows or blowgun darts dipped in curare, leading to asphyxiation as a result of the inability of the victim's respiratory muscles to contract. In the central nervous system, acetylcholine has been found to be involved in brain plasticity, arousal, and reward. It also has an important role in the enhancement of sensory perceptions when we wake up, and in sustaining attention. Acetylcholine has also been shown to promote REM sleep. Damage to acetylcholine-producing systems 
in the brain has been shown to be linked with memory deficits associated with Alzheimer's disease. Drugs that either increase the actions of or inhibit acetylcholine either improve memory function or produce amnesia. Thus, increasing the amount of acetylcholine in the brain is commonly used in an attempt to prevent the onset of Alzheimer's. An enzyme called acetylcholinesterase is responsible for the cleanup of acetylcholine after it has affected the postsynaptic receptors. This is important not only for treatment of Alzheimer's, but also in the military and in agriculture. Drugs that inhibit the action of the cleanup enzyme, thus leading more acetylcholine in the synapse, or acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, have been used in toxic doses for both insecticides and as lethal nerve gas. As stated earlier, less toxic and shorter acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are used clinically to delay the decline in cognitive functions related to Alzheimer's disease. Then we have the ever popular catecholamines. I have no doubt that you've heard of these two, dopamine and norepinephrine. Alterations in dopamine receptor functions have been implicated in numerous diseases and behavioral states. The so-called dopamine hypothesis for schizophrenia is based on the observation that drugs that increase levels of dopamine in the brain, such as amphetamine and cocaine, can cause symptoms which resemble those present in psychosis, particularly after large doses or prolonged use. Therefore, Many have concluded that schizophrenia results from too much dopamine in the system, and drugs that treat psychosis inhibit dopamine transmission. In contrast, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including shaking, muscle rigidity, slowness of movement, and difficulty with walking and gait, result from the death of dopamine-generating cells in the substantia nigra, a region of the midbrain. The main family of drugs useful for treating motor symptoms are levodopa, a precursor for dopamine, dopamine agonists, and MAO inhibitors, all drugs related to production of or prevention of the inhibition of dopamine. MAO inhibitors inhibit the enzymes identified as monoamine oxidase, or MAO, which eliminate or clean up dopamine in the synaptic cleft. So, whereas schizophrenia may be a result of too much dopamine in the system, Parkinson's may be the case of too little dopamine in the system. You will also see that medications to treat each of these diseases can have side effects which look like symptoms of the other. For example, a side effect of antipsychotic medication is what is called Parkinsonian side effects, which includes slowed movement, decreased facial expression, resting tremors, and a shuffling gait. Significant evidence indicates that dopamine neurotransmission is also affected in Huntington's disease, a neurodegenerative genetic disorder that also affects muscle coordination and leads to cognitive decline and psychiatric problems. The findings on dopamine in regard to mood disorders suggest that decreased dopamine activity is involved in depression, while increased dopamine function contributes to mania. Dopamine is also implicated in behaviors related to sexual activity and reward mechanisms. In other words, rewarding experiences show raised dopamine levels. ADHD may also have a connection with dopamine. One study involving adults showed that adults with ADHD had a sluggish dopamine system. This may explain why stimulant ADHD medications such as Ritalin and Adderall are beneficial. Stimulant ADHD medications increase dopamine by strengthening the weak dopamine signals in the brain, countering the decreased brain dopamine activity. In addition, drugs of abuse like nicotine and cocaine temporarily increase, increase brain dopamine activity. Our other catecholamine, norepinephrine, can act as a hormone or a neurotransmitter. Norepinephrine is activated by a stressful event, producing an alert, focused, orienting response. Norepinephrine affects attention capacity via our amygdala. Along with epinephrine, norepinephrine underlies the fight or flight response, directly increasing heart rate, triggering the release of glucose from energy stores, 
and increasing blood flow to our skeletal muscles, preparing for flight as necessary. Norepinephrine also increases blood pressure, thereby increasing the brain's oxygen supply. It is associated with positive feelings of reward and analgesia. It may also be related to instinctual behaviors such as hunger, thirst, emotion, and sex. The function of norepinephrine in the etiology and treatment of depressive disorders is currently an area of intense research. It is not entirely understood what role norepinephrine plays, but a substantial body of, ev of evidence indicates that both dopamine and norepinephrine play important roles in both the physiological causes of depression and the therapeutic effects of antidepressants. Another well-known neurotransmitter is serotonin, often associated with feelings of well-being and happiness. Serotonin was first investigated in the 1950s when LSD was found to structurally resemble serotonin. Today, drugs that increase the action of serotonin are widely used as antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents, useful in treating OCD, panic disorders, and phobias. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, aka SSRIs, are very common antidepressant medications. You will probably recognize the brand names Prozac, Alexa, Lexapro, Paxil, and Zola. As mentioned before, these drugs act by, as the name suggests, inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin in the synapse, thereby striving to increase the possibility of serotonin binding to a receptor. There are also antidepressant medications that are SNRI, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Brand name examples are Effexor, Prestique, Cymbalta, and Remeron. There's some evidence that SNRIs are somewhat more effective for treating severe depression. However, the side effects are more plentiful in comparison to SSRIs. Less known about serotonin is that approximately 90% of the human body's serotonin can be found in our gastrointestinal system, involved in both diarrhea and vomiting. Increasingly, drugs that block serotonin are very effective in controlling the nausea and vomiting produced by cancer treatment and are now considered the gold standard for this purpose. Also, serotonin's presence in insect venoms and plant spines serves to cause pain, which is a side effect of serotonin injection. And its widespread presence in many seeds and fruits may serve to stimulate the, dig the digestive tract into expelling the seeds. Serotonin is also implicated in sleep, sex, aging, bone mass, and the regulation of body temperature. Several classes of drugs target the serotonin system. Besides antidepressant and anxiolytics, antipsychotics, antiemetics, as mentioned before, to prevent nausea and vomiting, and anti-migraine drugs involve serotonin. Also, the psychedelic drugs psilocybin, DMT, mescaline, LSD, as well as MDMA, more commonly known as ecstasy, are agonists, meaning they accelerate the action of serotonin receptors. Have I lost you yet? So take a deep breath, maybe hit pause, do a little stretching. I've got three more neurotransmitters or groups of neurotransmitters that I want to highlight left. I'll try and keep it brief. Moving on to glutamate. This is a major excitatory neurotransmitter. That's my image of excited. Present on, all virtu on virtually all neurons in the brain. Glutamate is a non-essential amino acid easily synthesized by the body. Glutamate neurotransmission plays a in cognitive function, motor function, and sensory function. It also is important in synaptic plasticity and is therefore involved in the molecular processes that underlie learning and memory. Interactions with one of glutamate's primary receptors, the NMDA receptors, regulates long-term potentiation which is the long-lasting enhancement of signal transmission between two neurons that results from stimulating them again and again. In other words, you may recall Hebb's rule, which is often paraphrased, paraphrased as neurons that fire together, wire together. 
Glutamate is vital to plasticity of the brain. Excesses in glutamate can trigger death of neurons and may play a role in the neuronal injury that accompanies long-term alcoholism, Alzheimer's disease, head injury, and other disorders. Gamma aminobutyric acid, aka GABA, is a universally inhibitory transmitter found in high concentrations in the brain and spinal cord. I want you to remember GABA is anxiolytic, amnestic, and anesthetic effects. Barbiturates and benzodiazepines bind to GABA receptors, popular for their properties to sedate and relax you. Some anti-anxiety medications, anti-convulsants, and cognitive enhancers also utilize the GABA receptors. Activation of GABA receptors in the amygdala is associated with anti-aggressive properties of valproic acid, commonly known by one brand name, Depakote, for treating bipolar disorder. Last on my list of important neurotransmitters are the peptides, which actually are small proteins or chains of amino acid molecules attached in a particular order. One important group of peptides is the opiate type peptides, the endorphins and enkephalins. Endorphins may be involved in a wide variety of emotional states, pain perception, reward, emotional stability, and energy highs. Opiates, such as morphine, codeine, and heroin, activate opiate receptors. I'm not going to go into great detail about hormones, but I think it's important to understand a few basic pieces of information. Hormones are a product of the endocrine system, which, similar to the nervous system, functions in the regulation of body activity. Whereas the nervous system acts instantaneously through electrical impulses and neurotransmitters to cause muscle contraction and glandular secretion, the endocrine system acts through hormones which, over a period of minutes, hours, weeks, or even years, affect growth and development as well as metabolic activity. The pituitary gland is about the size of a pea. It's connected to the hypothalamus and works intimately with the hypothalamus to regulate homeostasis by secreting numerous hormones. Hormones secreted by the pituitary gland include growth hormone, targeting most tissues throughout the body with the purpose of stimulating growth by way of promoting protein synthesis, thyroid stimulating hormone, targeting the thyroid gland, which causes the thyroid to function, adrenocorticotropic hormone, targeting the adrenal cortex, plays a role in the release of cortisol and also affects skin pigmentation. Gonadotropic hormones target the ovaries and testes and are responsible for regulating the growth and function of those organs. For example, follicle stimulating hormones stimulates the development of eggs in the ova and sperm in the testes. And luteinizing hormone causes ovulation and the production of sex hormones, progesterone and estrogen in the female. Prolactin promotes the development of glandular activity in the female breast during pregnancy and stimulates milk production after the birth of the infant. Antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, promotes the reabsorption of water by the kidneys, conserving water for the body. Oxytocin causes the uterine muscles contracting during birth and stimulates the release of milk from the lactating breast. You may have heard of Pitocin, a form of oxytocin sometimes given to the woman to induce labor. The pineal gland is the gland responsible for synthesizing melatonin, which you probably already know, modulates sleep-wake cycles and seasonal functions. The hypothalamus, roughly the size of an almond, is a cluster of neurons responsible for certain metabolic processes and other activities of the autonomic nervous system. It synthesizes and secretes hypothalamic-releasing hormones, which stimulate or inhibit the secretion of hormones in its close neighbor, the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus controls body temperature, hunger, important aspects of parenting and attachment behaviors, thirst, fatigue, sleep, and circadian rhythm. The thyroid gland, 
is important for metabolism and for managing blood calcium levels. Hormones associated with the thyroid are thyroxin and calcitonin. The parathyroid glands target bone, kidneys, and the dig digestive tract. Parathyroid glands are also important with regard to the management of calcium in the body. The adrenal glands are made up of the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. The cortex is important with regard to sodium and potassium management, as well as increasing blood glucose levels. The adrenal medulla, which secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine, helps us cope with stress. The pancreas produces glucogen, necessary for increasing blood glucose levels, and insulin, which decreases blood glucose levels. Then we have the testes and ovaries, responsible for the maturation and maintenance of the male and female sex organs. And last but certainly not least, the thymus, famed producer of the hormone thymosin, important for immune system development and function. I'll never forget when I was in massage school, my anatomy instructor would have us thump our thymus, meaning drumming our chest with our fists to stimulate our immune system. Now I know that was a lot of information, and I know you won't remember it all, but I hope you now have a good idea of what the difference between hormone and neurotransmitters are, and can now recognize them when you hear or read about them. Our assignments for the next two weeks are similar to those you've been doing so far, so no surprises. Continue with the reading, the coloring exercises, and the terms and concepts assignment. I look forward to interacting with you on the discussion forum. Here are the references I used for this lecture. Photos were courtesy of Google Images, and some information was gathered through the help of Wikipedia.